It is precisely 4.30, so I'll call your attention and we'll get started. My name is Patty Pryor, and I would like to welcome you to our event today, Research Brown Bag, sponsored by Lubbock Christian University School of Nursing and Center of Excellence and Covenant Health, and also endorsed by Sigma Theta Tau uh, Iota Mu Chapter. Well, welcome today. I'm so glad you came. Our goal is to have a forum to showcase scholarly work and role model and provide that bridge from school to professional practice. So we're going to have a wonderful program today. I'm going to um, turn it over in a moment to Susan Sayari to introduce your speakers. The bathrooms are located right outside this door if uh, you need to step out for a moment. And please help yourself to all of the refreshments, which I understand are provided by Lubbock Christian University Center of Excellence. Thank you very much. I am proud to say that I am no longer a member of the student body here, but I am a <laughs> member of the Alumni Association. And I was recently interviewed by someone about oh, Obamacare and the future of nursing and all that sort of thing. And she asked me, what can we do to assist nurses in getting their advanced degrees and, and developing their careers and, and advancement like they, they want to? And one of the things I told her was to get involved in your alumni association because there's so much coaching and nurturing and support and even financial opportunities that you may not have otherwise. And then sometimes what happens in the Alumni Association produces an example that hospitals and other organizations will follow. So it can be a very effective tool. We're having a meeting today when this program is over at 530 and it'll be in this room. So I hope you can stay for that. Now, without further ado, we'll turn it over to Susan Sayari to introduce our esteemed speakers today. Good afternoon. Hope y'all are doing good. I'm uh, with great privilege to be able to introduce and talk a little bit about uh, Mary Beth Lyons. Mary Beth um, and I have worked at Covenant for many years. She's uh, been with the program, uh, been with the school, and been with the uh, hospital for about 18 years. She attended South Plains College and graduated and uh, finished there in 1997. She came to work at Covenant and she graduated from BSN and her MSN here at LCU, finishing her MSN in uh, 2011. Mary Beth uh, con uh, continues to be a strong advocate toward uh, nursing education. She loves research and she loves what she does. She has worked in various roles throughout the hospital and just done an exceptional job. Her current role is the nurse manager of intermediate care on South Five. She's a, a true leader there. Uh, works with her staff very, very well and does an excellent job. So I know that you're going to enjoy listening to Mary Beth and um, her uh, topic today, as you can see, is exploring alternative pain management methods uh, for extra nurses in mid surge and cardiac units. Uh, as a special treat today, it is Mary Beth's birthday. Uh, <laughs> I think everybody has to celebrate with hugs and, and well wishes for her birthday because it's uh, a great day for her as well. Let me also introduce Dr. Beverly Byers. Dr. Beverly Byers will be doing her response to Mary Beth's uh, lecture. And uh, Dr. Byers has, of course, been here at the School of Nursing for a long time. Dr. Byers got her Bachelor's of Nursing from West Texas A&M University. She got her Master's from Texas Tech University and her Doctorate in Higher Education as well from Texas Tech University. Dr. Byers has about 30 years of experience in nursing, holding a variety of positions throughout uh, the nursing program. Some of those, and in, in her past life, she worked in surgery, mental health, chemical dependency, and ecology health. Uh, Dr. Byers has been an educator and taught the RN BSN nursing class for about 20 years. She is, uh, uh, has founded uh, the School of Massage Therapy in 1999 and developed the curriculum uh, around that for the school as well as teaching massage therapy. She has um, always been an active, strong leader here at the School of Nursing in administrative roles and, position, and, and different positions throughout her journey. She is the founder and owner and director of Ocean's Massage Therapy School. She's been associate dean of the students for three years and the dean of the students for four years at LCU. Dr. Byers currently serves as the director of the MSN program 
Security LCU. She's a great friend of mine. I love working with her, and I think you'll really enjoy and love her response. So, without further ado, let's get Mary Beth Okay. Okay, we're going to try this. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I may get a little loud. I project very well without a microphone, so um, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to have Dr. Byer, she's going to be rotating the slides for me, so I'll be pointing to her. Yeah, I hope that doesn't upset anybody. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk to you about my passion. Um, I have a real passion for pain management, um, all levels of pain management. And just a show of hands, can y'all tell me uh, how many of you guys think pain is in the brain? Just a question. It's, it's active. Everybody needs to raise their hand. So, Okay, well, I'll answer that question here in just a few moments. We'll get to that. But right now, just looking at my, my title slide, Exploring Alternative Pain Management Methods of Registered Nurses in Med Surge and Cardiac Telemetry Units, um, that alone has led me on many, many, many roads. Um, Dr. Byers has had to reel me in a few times. I've had to reel myself in a few times because you can literally um, go out on thousand, a thousand different ways in, in different directions. So I'm going to start by answering these two questions. Uh, do post after patients receive adequate pain control while in med surge and cardiac telemetry units? And can nurses learn to better assess post-operative pain, patient's pain and improve patient care by using alternative manage, management methods? So we're going to answer those two questions throughout this presentation today. First of all, um, I think we have to define pain. Uh, way back a long time ago in 1968, Margot McCaffrey, she said that pain it's whatever the experience in person says it is, and it exists whenever he or she says it does. So that was way back in 1968. Today, I went to a seminar not long ago, just recently, um, Dr. Michael Howard, um, I don't know, some of y'all may have gone to that, was really good. He said, pain is in the brain. That's all I heard that day, was pain was in the brain. So I've done, there's thousands of articles on it, if you go and you research it, there's just literally tons of articles on it. So I'm going to show you this YouTube video, and it explains why we think pain is in the brain. Okay. I think we're going to try to play it and then he's going to hold that up. If it doesn't, um, I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain. Okay. Okay, I don't think you're going to be able to hear it. Uh, basically what it's saying here is that no susceptive pain, uh, you start, you, you prick your finger, you burn your finger, it travels up the nerve endings all the way up into the spinal cord, and it doesn't actually register as pain until it gets to the uh, cortex of the brain where it hits your emotions, and that's, where, that's when it turns into pain. So... Uh, that's basically, it was a short video to show that and how, how it traveled across the synapse there, but I'm um, sorry, you can't, we can't hear that. We'll just move on. That's basically what I wanted you to get out of that, is that it's, people don't even feel that it's pain until it actually hits the cortex and um, it becomes an emotion. So, now where are we? Do you want me to do it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now that we know that, some of the barriers uh, as to why we can't control pain, um, we have to address them. And so that's, that's really hard to do. First of all, nurses lack knowledge and education on the, on the, in this area. Um, that's, 
a pretty blatant statement. However, um, there's a lot of articles out there that support this, and nurses feel like that they control pain pretty well. However, we have a gap because the patients don't feel that. Um, we're seeing that in our HCAP scores. Our HCAP scores are not matching what our, our nurses are saying. Um, the next one is that we just flat don't, just go back, I'm sorry. Uh, the next barrier that we have is that we don't have a curriculum built in our nursing schools. So I was going to see how far back I had to go to trace this and how far we needed to educate people. And when I was going back, I went all the way back into our nursing schools. Um, nursing schools, they teach uh, oncology, med surge pain, but really an in-depth pain program is not in our nursing schools. So we're having GNs come out of nursing school and having to figure out this as experience, um, just as they, they gain experience on the unit. Nurses' attitudes, uh, own attitudes and beliefs towards patient pain. And I think this one, I'm a little bit passionate about this one. So um, you have to really focus on what your attitude is towards that patient's pain. I hear a lot just on my unit, and I know it's not my unit. I don't know who died and made us all judges, but it's happened. Nurses judge their patients all the time. We hear things like patients are drug seekers, frequent flyers. We hear words like that all the time. And uh, as nurses, if we go back to the Florence Nightingale days, she was there to heal. She wasn't there to judge. And so we need to get back to those days of um, figuring out a way that we can uh, change our attitudes and our beliefs towards our patients. And I know that there's going to be a lot of people say, well, but this, well, but that. So I'm going to give you some ammunition here, I think. Um, another barrier is nurses just lack the time to follow through. So on my unit, nurses can have up to four patients. So one patient could be going to the cath lab, one patient could be going to surgery, one patient the doctor just went in and said, you're going home, and guess what, he's dressed, he's ready to go home. And then we have the other one who's in pain that we gave Tylenol to at seven o'clock in the morning, which one do you think suffered the most out of that group? So we, we tend to go to the patient that um, is hollering the loudest. And sometimes it can be the pain patient. So, next. Some more barriers. Um, nurses, uh, not only nurses, but physicians under treat pain too. So, if you call a, a physician about this patient, uh, a patient's pain, and you need to have ammunition. I mean, you need to know what's going on with that patient. If you call and say, Dr. So-and-so, my patient's in pain. What's he going to say? Well, I already got him some pain medicine, so just give him some Norco and they sh that should be good. So what you've got to tell them, you've got, the more descriptive that you can be with that physician, tell them what you want with your patient. You know your patient. You've been with them. Um, if they have a broken ankle and they've had a broken ankle now for four weeks, but they're in there for abdominal pain. So we're treating the abdominal, abdominal pain, however, uh, the ankle was hurting from four weeks ago. So we forgot that part. Or we forgot uh, that maybe he has an abscess in his mouth because he's got a swollen tooth. So now he's got nerve pain. Um, we also, my nurses are at the door, opening the door and shutting the door. We have so many admissions and discharges. They're saying, hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye, hello. So, isn't that right? <laughs> um, so, it, you know, it's really, really hard to um, focus on a patient's pain when you've got that kind of activity. So that's a barrier. And then nurses fear calling physicians. Some of the things that you can do to avoid to call a physician in the middle of the night, you have any suggestions? Call them during the day. Before your patient's pain gets out of control um, at, in the night time, do your night nurses a favor. Call them. 
call them and get them on a schedule. Say, Dr. So-and-so, my patient is on Tylenol. I need them to be on, I would like for them to be on an IV medication with breakthrough medication in between. They're also having nerve pain. Can we put them on some Neurotin? So now you've got a happy camper. And of course he's going to want to know the BUN and the creatinine level, so you need to have all that information there as well. So tell them what you want. Know your patient. Tell them what, what you want. Next. And then we just flat missed the obvious, and I put this cartoon up here. This is a 32-year-old male who was admitted last night with fever, chills, nausea, sweating, and severe abdominal pain. And they're just flat overlooking the arrow in his stomach. So sometimes it's as obvious as that. So survey of the nurses. Um, HCAP surveys, we used to do HCAP surveys a whole different way than we're doing them now. Um, but when I was looking at this, we randomly sent them out to the patients. And they were showing, yes, we did have a gap. Our nurses are feeling like that they're controlling the pain. But when you look at the patient scores, there's definitely a gap there. And so that's what we have to do is, is look at that gap. We also, or I also surveyed 40 nurses. And incredible enough, I got 40 surveys back. Um, so I did this on both cardiac telemetry and med surge patients. I did it on a Lockhart five-point scale. I asked 10 questions. And I have three sample questions that I'll share with you. Sample question number one, it had to do with knowledge regarding different types of pain. Um, very knowledgeable was nine. Knowledgeable was 22. Somewhat knowledgeable was eight. Not as knowledgeable as I should be was one. So we have 31 nurses who are not very, think that they're very knowledgeable about um, taking care of a patient's pain. The second question had to do with assessing the region and severity. Um, 18 said always, 13 said sometimes, and 9 said usually. And again, we have a lot of room there for, for improvement on that. It kind of disturbs me that we have that many n nurses who sometimes or usually do it. So we should get that to always. I think that if we get that to always, we can make our HCAP scores um, go through the roof on uh, pain management. This one had, um, it, it, this one is discussing different types of pain with the patient. And uh, 12 said always, 17 said sometimes, 8 said usually, and 2 said never. So there again, um, if we could move those, even those sometimes to always, we'd have um, better results with that, with our HCAP scores and controlling their pain. Now the patients, um, we surveyed the patients um, by me making rounds. I make rounds on my unit every single day. And I can tell you there's a gap there. Um, when I asked them, how are we controlling your pain, um, they said that there's just a gap. Are we discussing the different types of pains? No. Do we? Um, tell them what kind of medications that they're on? No. So we're, we're not really going into depth with our patients on, on their pain and, and the pain needs. And I have a pain toolkit um, on my unit and our, HCAP team, our HCAPS team developed this. Um, we've kind of scattered it out a little bit, made it a little bit more easier to get to. Um, we have pillows, the heart pillows, because a lot on my unit we have mostly incisional pain. Um, we have a lot of chest tubes, so we need to support those incisional pains with the, with the pillow. We have crossword puzzles, seek and finds. Um, I even find that people like to color. So um, just depending, I mean, you've got all different kinds of personalities. Um, we do have a care channel now, channel 17. Um, that we put our patients with all the time if they're in a lot of pain and we can't control it. We use that quite a bit. Um, I also now have access to the IT department. Um, they bring in computers for the younger generation. I also found that the care channel is not real good for the younger population. 
Um, they don't really like that kind of music, so <laughs> you have to really kind of look at your crowd and know who you're serving. We have a great guest service department who will bring you anything that you want. All you have to do is call them and ask them, and they're wonderful, and our IT department is too. So the paint toolkit I keep on the unit for nighttime use, um, just in case they might need something for even a confused patient. It helps with, some of that helps with confused patient. Coloring really helps with confused patients. So. Alternative and integrative methods. Some of this we're doing already. Um, pet therapy. We have a, a group that comes in from time to time that brings their pet, and my favorite one is Dexter. He's a Great Dane. Um, Y'all may have seen him. He's about yay tall. He goes and he sits beside the bed, and um, he puts his head on, on their uh, beds, and it's wonderful to see. He's so big, he can just sit there, and they can just love on him, and he's just wonderful. Um, I did have one patient who was so depressed um, that he wanted his pet, and his daughter had been sneaking the pet, the chihuahua, in, in a bag. So, um, so I don't know who caught him on my unit, but somebody caught him. And so we uh, told her, you know, absolutely uh, let the patient see his dog. And so we just made it legal. And so I really think that that really helped that little guy heal and go home. Um, so there's all different kinds of pet therapy that you can do. Um, all, like I said, the music, the care channel, we have that. Um, every room, you can have access to that on channel 17. And then uh, new ways that Dr. Bev and I have really discussed, and we have a lot of hoops still to go through, um, but she's a licensed massage um, instructor, and we have talked many times about having um, her come in and teach the nurses how to do light massage. So we hope to get that, that into, integrated into our system. Um, Karen Baggerly's here, so uh, hopefully we can talk to her some on that as well. Um, acupuncture uh, is another one of my favorites. I hear that it just does wonders. I've never had it before. The problem with it is, is that it's not covered by insurance companies, and so that's why doctors won't use it. So most of the time you see it in outpatient settings, and um, it's supposed to be very, very good. So, My future projects are to educate the nurses, of course. Um, I've gone into the nursing school at Covenant, and I have taught a class there, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, I hope that I get to do that in the future. Uh, the kids were very receptive to this, and um, I was told that I would be invited back, so I can't wait to do that. And then I wanna continue my, I wanna continue a research project, a real one. So this one's just a, you know, kind of the beginning. Um, it's taken me a long time to lay this foundation. Like I said, I've been off on tangents a lot. So the other day, Dr. Byers was like, you gotta come back, <laughs> so. Um, I came back to have my original slide, and um, I would like to um, probably write an article and maybe even a book in the future. So, Florence Nightingale, you can't leave, have a presentation without Florence in it. I think one's feelings waste themselves in words. They ought all to be distilled into action, which brings results. So don't waste your time. You know, find your passion and um, make it happen. And then in summary, again, we have to mind the gap. We've got to really figure out the gap between physicians, nurses, and uh, patients, and how we can bring all of that together and uh, control the patient's pain, keep the physicians happy, keep the nurses to where they can control the pain. Nurses are so happy when they can know that their patients are comfortable and if we can get to that level, um, that's, that's the goal. And I think that's it. I think I have my references there. Do y'all have any questions? Anybody? Okay, well I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Byers. You want my necklace? 
Oh, you get your own. Looking at a study on nurses on your unit and all the things you've identified, going back into nursing schools and trying to um, put this in a curriculum, a little bit more than what you've seen. And then, really, um, I know Mary Beth has already started developing a tool uh, to. Uh, take a survey or questionnaire for the patients in addition to what the hospital does. But, you know, of course, that would be future research. But she's already thinking about that. We want to know what the, what the patients think. And just so many, so many ways that you could take this. I'm really, I'm really proud of you. We're all proud of you. But I hope you're proud of yourself because it. You have been thinking about this a long time, and to take something um, with your own unit and try to work at improving it uh, is a great thing, you know. And that's that's what we want is to put it into practice and make a difference, and to really mind the gap. So, um, excellent job. Thank you. Excellent job. Um, I think we ought to just kind of have a little discussion about what do you, um, how do you see pain or how do you agree with where you work that there might be a gap there as well in pain management? Raise Maybe your hand. The comment if you... that Mary Beth made about um, the attitude of the nurses, um, being a frequent flyer, pain seeking, not only comes from the nursing staff but also from the medical staff. And I think if we could really focus on that a lot, um, that, that would be beneficial. Because it's really, it's a big struggle sometimes to talk to your um, staff when, yes, you know this person's been here 15 times, and they probably don't have the most healthy lifestyle outside the hospital. But that doesn't mean that what they're going through isn't real to them at the time. And um, trying to keep people focused on patient care rather than all the extraneous things that are going on. It's a big struggle, and so I really think we need a lot more education focused on that and how to keep that out of our vocabulary. And I'm going to be talking again on December 7th um, with Dr. Brian Nicholson, and we're going to focus on the side of the patient, and it's going to be at the um, annual pain symposium mm -hmm. um, there at Covenant in the connect link and I have some flyers if y'all want to take some of those as well mm -hmm. but just like what we said before pain is an emotion um, so whenever you have um, depression mm -hmm. or you have anxiety um, that exacerbates pain mm -hmm. so it just makes sense to go ahead and treat those two things and then treat the pain mm -hmm. you know 
know, so there's lots of things. There's just so many things. You, you can go off on a tangent with drugs, or you can go off on a tangent. There's just so many, like, like she said, it's just like an octopus. There's just so many ways that you could go to research. Mm -hmm. So, I think in, in her uh, title, she's exploring alternative pain measures. And the word alternative is really in lieu of. So uh, we're, I know that she's looked at that like you might could go to the toolkit and use something from the toolkit instead of um, using pain medicine if you felt that you know was an option to try that first. I think also you might want to look at the words complementary and integrative. There are a lot of hospitals that are using integrative medicine and they have they actually have massage therapists on staff, they have um, Reiki, uh, people who perform Reiki on staff, and particularly in oncology units is where I've seen a lot of that. But I think the alternative may be giving way to some of these, uh, you know, to the word integrative, where you're really putting everything together and using them together. Uh, let's see, do you have any questions so far? I just want to, I think it's interesting how we're going back to massage. Since when I first graduated, that was expected. You, you go in, you get them. <laughs> Hydrators get their bedtime pills and give them a back massage before they go to sleep. And they did. They rested. So now we're going back to that. I think we've just gotten away from a lot of the basics. And there again, I think if you just think of Florence and back in her day, you know, I mean, she t she treated a whole lot of soldiers back then. And, you know, I know she was busy as well. but. They had that attitude, that healing attitude. I just wish we could get to that point again. And one of the things we kind of come as a case manager, being a patient navigator, help navigate that patient through, so, so many times we have patients come back to our ER and really it's due to pain. And it can be either physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, but we're not addressing that piece and so they're constantly coming back, but then they come back and they have a different provider. It's a different doctor every time they come to the ER. They get readmitted under a different service. They get passed around, and eventually, then they earn the, the term of a free required. Nobody wants to deal with them. They're too much trouble. And so we had a meeting this week with some of our staff uh, attendings and stuff from Jack and on the UMC side to talk about we need to do better management, identifying those patients up front. When they come into our system, whether it's the ER or the clinic or whatever, and ensure that they get the same provider and so that we get to know that person and their situation and be able to help navigate them through their crisis when it was happening to help manage that pain. And it's okay to say if they really are having pain, it's okay to give them their Dilaudid or their whatever. But we need to also address the other issues that's happening with them. And so I think that's something else that's another piece of the toolkit we could ask is to be a patient navigator, help that patient make sure that we drive them through so they get the same people and they don't have to tell their story over and over and over again. They have somebody who's consistent enough to rely on and call and say, this is what's happening, and they can avoid the big pain crisis or the big problems that they're having and be able to manage their, their pain in their life and stuff. That was a great. That's a sweet. That's probably a whole another arm in itself. Yes, it that is. So that's weird. awesome. It's a whole other. <laughs> that's a world, isn't it? But again, it's yeah. another big, big piece of the puzzle. It is. That's, that's how yeah. we do our patients because they we need to look at them in a multiple fashion because it's not just the person. It's the person that they need. Well, and, you know, like I said, even if they are addicted to drugs, well, we need to address that problem. That's a problem. Somebody needs to address it. So they've been in the ER like 50 times, and they've seen different doctors. Different doctors put them on different drugs. So now they have 50 different drugs. And so, you know, how would you not be addicted if you were in that situation for that length of time? So we need to be more creative because we've had 
we've had several patients who have addiction problems. They come in and they've got other issues, but then we're not addressing the addiction problem. That's it. Yep. And so we've kind of done some contracting with some of these patients to say, if you're willing to take that step, we are willing to help you and then be supportive of them addressing the addiction along with the health issues that they've got there. And we've had some really good results with it, but again, you're doing kind of the navigating and putting them with a provider or a person kind of connecting so that they've got something when they leave, they've got something they can come back to Absolutely. instead of just a, a white door and open the door, I don't know where to go. Right. So, I agree. I want, to, I want to remind you all that you, um, you know, your license is to touch people and your license allows you to do massage. Uh, I think what Mary Beth is wanting to do is maybe formalize it just a little bit and learn specific things about massage and actually, you know, start giving you the confidence that you can do that empower our nurses you know we just and what we found um, in the literature is if you take the time to do those things you may <laughs> think you don't have time but it increases the patient satisfaction and they may be asking less for your attention mm -hmm. so that's that's really uh, true so it's a, it's within your scope of practice to do massage if you want to call it that yeah a few months ago, I came across an article about a new syndrome that had been identified and has yet to have further research to validate it, but something called post-hospitalization syndrome that puts people at risk for being readmitted within 30 days after they go home. And it has to do with the whole hospital experience, pain, dehydration, uh, sleep deprivation, uh, poor nutrition, that, that whole experience makes people very vulnerable during that first 30 days after their discharge and they end up being readmitted. So if you think about if we don't manage their pain very well, not only are they having pain, but now they can't sleep either and they don't have an appetite either and they're very stressed and it just leaves it goes through that whole scenario and it's kind of a motivator really that there is really important to do everything we can to manage their pain. And I think nurses have a lot more influence and control over that than we give ourselves credit for sometimes. I have a question to ask each of you and it might be something when you get into the research more to ask the nurses and that is have you ever had post-operative pain? Have you had it? Raise your hand if you've had post-operative pain. It's a different kind of pain than anything else, isn't it? And maybe some nurses are judging the pain without really knowing what it feels like, so. Make them have surgery, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. since it is an emotion, you, you can't feel that emotion for that patient, so. I just happened to think this time last year my sister was was in the hospital. She she was she had had postoperative pain, and she I, I don't know she was I don't re, re, really remember exactly what she was getting, but it was really pretty mild. It might have been Tylenol or something, but maybe a little bit heavier than, than Tylenol. But she told me that in the middle of the night she was gripping the side rail so hard and had her eyes shut because she didn't know she could ask for something else. And so when the nurse came in, because she had her eyes closed, she assumed she was pain free. Mm -hmm. And then when she actually turned the light on and went over there and looked at her and she's, the whole thing's shaking, mm -hmm. she realized she was hurting, but she didn't, she just didn't feel like she could say, I'm, I'm hurting, I need something. She just thought she had to withstand that. Yeah. There's a lot of patients like that. You know, that's why I was saying about putting them on a schedule. You know, get your patients. I mean, if they've had, if they have a chest tube and the doctor has done open heart surgery, they have, they've had lots of trauma. It hurts. So put them on a schedule. Ask your doctor. All they can say is no. Right? I mean, they can't come through the phone and just beat you up right there. 
So ask them about that. I mean, and I think that that's a good example of that. I think Elaine also brings up a very good point about we don't do a good job with telling our patients that they have other options as far as pain management because um, you know, I had a personal experience with a family member that was nauseated all night and didn't know that they could ask for something. And as nurses, you know, we didn't do a good job of saying, hey, you can have this for nausea or you can have this for pain or let me know if this doesn't work and I'll see what else I can do for you. Yeah. So I really think that we have to explore those, those conversations with our patients and let them know that they have other alternatives besides just the Tylenol or just the, the Norco or whatever it's ordered. Yeah, and I think that that uh, brings up a good point about the, you know, and I think UMC does too, but we have the whiteboards and, and that's what they're there for. They're there to communicate with your patients. So, but what they have up there and when the next, you know, when the next dose is due. So they don't have to, constantly call you and ask you, they can look up there and say, it's due then. However, you know, we also need to tell them that if it's not controlling their pain, there's got to be a different schedule that we can go with them. So there's just other options. And that's what we need to, to I mean, you know, we can put them on Tramadol or Tordol. Those are really good options um, to ask for. So, anyway, just question. First of all, great job. Thank you so Thank much. You. Appreciate you both so much. And it's sure a wonderful time to see, um, you know, nursing claiming our own knowledge and having the ability to ask important questions and know how to get answers. So thank you for um, you know, your leadership there. I appreciate that very much. I wanted to know, I was curious, since we only saw a sample of the questions that you were exploring, did you have like a major take home in terms of your own understanding about what are the barriers? What's the main barrier that is keeping us from adequately taking care of our patients' pain? Well, I really think it's knowledge. I mean, I think that we address acute and chronic pain very, very well, but neuropathic, and you look at somatic and visceral pain, we just don't talk about it. We, we don't address it. And, and then the other thing too is, is that nurses just don't feel like that they have time to sit down with their patients and have this big conversation with them. They just feel busy. And I think that that is a lot of it, but I think if we can get on the other side of it, if we can control the pain, like Candy said, and you know they're going to be happier so they're not going to be calling us as much but i just think it's an education issue and it's a change of culture so you just got to get there well I'll, I'll just wrap it up by saying thanks again and i'm looking forward to uh, tagging along on this journey with mary beth if she'll let me as we go further and, and really, you know, may, maybe making a, a difference, a big difference in patients' lives and with nurses, building up confidence of how to handle this in, in an appropriate way. I, I'm very passionate about alternative, complementary, and integrative medicine. I think there's so much there that we can uh, embrace that helps patients, helps nurses, and I think this is a great way to um, get going on a on an actual unit if, if we're able to go further with this. So thank you. Thank you.